Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from the Gospel of Matthew, and I'm going to be reading chapter 9. I'll start at verse 1 and then jump over to verse 9, and this is what it says. And the he that's being spoken of here is Jesus. And getting into a boat, he crossed over and came to his own city. In verse 9, and as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And it happened that as he was reclining at table in the house, behold, many tax gatherers and sinners came and joined Jesus and his disciples at the table. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with the tax gatherers and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are ill. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Join with me, let's pray. Lord, enter into your word that it might be made life in us. And that our lives be transformed as we follow. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. The way the story goes, all the animals in the forest divided up teams for a football game. And um, the teams seemed pretty even until the team that the rhinoceros was on, they gave him the football. Well, nobody could tackle the rhinoceros. He just walked down the field, scored a touchdown. And every time the rhinoceros touched the ball, he just walked down the field and scored a touchdown. Nobody could tackle the rhinoceros. Well, the other team, they realized that they were in trouble, bad trouble. That um, maybe the best they could hope for is just run around and let the time run out until halftime. And maybe the rhinoceros wouldn't come back for the second half. Well, halftime, they were four touchdowns behind. They were dejected because they, they, they knew that a, after the, the halftime was over that they were going to have to go back out onto the field and face the rhinoceros one more time. They were kicking off to the rhinoceros team. Well, kicked off the ball. Sure enough, the rhinoceros got the ball. He took two steps and wham, he was thrown to the, to the field. Well, they couldn't believe it. They started pulling off animals from all over the forest that, that were on top of the rhinoceros. And down at the bottom, at the bottom of the pile, it was the centipede. That the centipede had tackled the rhinoceros. Well, they couldn't believe it. There was hope in the game. And they said, we can't believe you were able to tackle the rhinoceros. Where have you been? The centipede said, I was putting on my shoes. That was an old joke when it was told the first time. And it's not the power of the joke, because it has no power at all. It's, it's the point of it. <laughs> the, the centipede was preparing. And sometimes the people never get on the field because they're just preparing. The word for today is follow. 
But sometimes folks don't follow because they're always getting ready. But Jesus' word, it calls us not just to get ready. That Matthew was called not because he was as good as he could be or better than he had been. Matthew was called to get on the field, get in the game, and to follow. But some people, some people, they, they never get in the game. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. That the word is follow, but some people don't follow because they get stuck in the past. Verse 1. I, I've read these verses many times, but I think I skipped over verse 1 by the time I, and, and forgot what it said by the time I got to verse 9. Verse 1 says, And getting into a boat, Jesus crossed over and came to his own city. That Matthew was the tax gatherer in Jesus' own city. Well, I don't think that's insignificant at all. That Jesus, Jesus, there's a good chance that he knew Matthew and Matthew's past. That the tax gatherer was known by everyone and generally hated by everyone because the tax gatherer had collaborated with the Roman government. He didn't just apply for a job, but he paid for the job. That he bid for the job. And the Roman government gave the job of the tax gatherer to the highest bidder. And once given the job, it was a license to steal. The Romans loved to give that job to, to someone that was homegrown. Some that, someone that was from that city who knew where the money was. Who knew wh- how many sheep a farmer had. They liked giving that job to someone who knew where that field was that might be far from the barn, that field that a stranger might never see, but someone from that city, someone from that town would know. The Romans liked someone from that city, from that town, who knew who delivered their goods to be sold on a cart because each cart was taxed by the number of wheels that it had. And all the Roman government did was they would assess a certain amount for a certain area and everything over and above that amount the tax collector got to keep. Knowing who was wealthy, knowing where the money was, it was licensed to extort money from people. It was very well that it could have been that, that Jesus had been robbed by Matthew, the tax collector. Jesus, as a carpenter, could have had, it could have been Matthew that took advantage of him. And if, if it wasn't Jesus directly, at least he knew people that Matthew had, had robbed, had taken advantage of. And that's the only connection that we know because all we have so far is that Jesus says follow. He didn't wait till he was good as he could be. He didn't wait till he was better than he had been. He didn't wait till he was the best he could be. He turned to Matthew, knowing his past, and he said follow. Years ago, I used to listen to Late Night with Tom Snyder. Well, I don't know if you remember that show. That was an old, old show. Um, and Tom Schneider was kind of an eccentric host of the show. He would do some things that were kind of quirky and a, and a little weird, but he had great guests. And I remember this particular night, his guest was a fellow named Itzhak Perlman. I had never heard of Itzhak Perlman before. I didn't know who he was. But when he began to play the violin, I had never heard anybody play any instrument like that before. He played with an incredible joy and an incredible beauty. So from that point on, every time that I I read the name Itzhak Perlman, I wanted to read what it said about him. Anytime I I saw on the TV that, that Itzhak Perlman was playing, I wanted to see it. Then my eyes and ears were quickened to 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 anything that had to do with Itzhak Perlman. Well, I found out that Itzhak Perlman very well may be one of the greatest violinists who's ever lived. And Itzhak Perlman, 
the way the story goes, was playing at the Lincoln Center when as a soloist there, he began to play and one of his strings on his violin broke. Well, it was loud enough for the conductor to hear and, and loud enough for all of the orchestra to hear and the conductor started to cut off the orchestra and that's when Itzhak Perlman waved off the conductor and continued to play his solo on three strings. A piece written for four strings in his head as he played he would rewrite the music well at the end of the piece the orchestra rose to give Itzhak Perlman a standing ovation as did the conductor and that's when Itzhak Perlman says sometimes the artist's task is to find out how much music you can still make with what you have left Sometimes it's the artist's task to find out how much music you can make with what you have left. That's all of our tasks. All of us, all of us have a past where we're broken. Not what we should be, not what we hope to be, not what we're going to be not what we wanted to be. That's not news to Jesus. That Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That knowing your past and mine, Jesus gave his life on the cross. Knowing what we would do and giving his life for you and me to wipe away all sin, he did it knowing, knowing what we've done, knowing where we've been, knowing what we've said. And that our past doesn't disqualify us. To Matthew, to you and to me. He says, follow, follow. The word is follow. Get in the game. Get going. Get on the field. Follow. But still, some get stuck in the past. Get in the game. Get going. Follow. But some don't get in the game, get going, and follow because they get stuck in the present. They get stuck in the present. Verse 9 says, and as Jesus passed by from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax office. That's all we know about Matthew. We know what his present situation is. Sitting in the tax office. He had a place. He had a role. He had an identity. So often it is we get caught up in that place, that role, that identity of doing what we've always done. We get focused on where it is that we are, focused in the present, and we miss the call. When I was in college, it shows how long ago it was, I lived in a dorm, college dorm, where there was one television in the whole college dorm. It was in the lobby. Students would gather around uh, during certain times of the day. There were one group of students that would gather around at times of, of soap operas, and they stayed glued to it. Some would even schedule their classes around certain soap operas. At 11 o'clock, there was another group of students that gather around for the evening news. I remember sitting there watching the evening news that night, and the, the lead story was about a fella in Atlanta who had landed his plane in the Kmart parking lot. Oh, and the, the reporter there on the scene with the cameraman was, was, was going into great detail about how he had been able to, his, his plane not, not having engine power was still able to, to, to glide over the, the, the power lines and miss the, the light post there in the Kmart parking lot. And, and what an incredible pilot he must have been to, to have missed all these obstacles and landed safely in the Kmart parking lot. And then they turned to the pilot, they stuck a mic in his face, and I said, I know that guy. It was a fellow that I had wrestled. I'd wrestled him several times in high school. 
And it turned out that summer, <laughs> I saw him. I saw him and I said, hey, I, I, I saw your moment of fame on TV and the, the, about how the, 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 the reporter talked about, you know, what a great job you did flying over the power lines and not hitting them and missing all of the light poles. They're landing at night in the Kmart parking lot. He had a, a really embarrassed look on his face. And I said, the one thing that the, that the reporter didn't ask is, why did you have to land in the Kmart parking lot? He said, oh, he said, I was uh, working on my pilot's license. He said, this was going to be my first solo night flight. He said, I, I, I got in the plane. I was going to fly up I-85 and land the plane, refuel, and then at night fly, fly back down. He said, but as I took off at night, I, I got so focused on the road that was in front of me, I didn't realize that I was not following I-85. I was following I-285, and I ran out of gas. <laughs> you know, getting focused, that sometimes that's a really good thing. But sometimes, just sometimes, we get so focused on what's right in front of us, we miss it. We miss the life that, that Jesus offers. We miss something more. We miss following Jesus instead, following just that that's right in front of us, that, that that's obvious. What's most obvious during this pandemic is we live in a culture of fear. You don't have to look far at all and the voice says, be afraid. And the next voice says, be very afraid. And the next voice says, be very, very, very afraid. And so we have a tendency to get focused in the present time and to circle our wagons, to hunker down and to get caught up in our own fear. To miss the voice of Jesus as he says, follow, follow, follow. Isaiah 41.10 says, do not fear for I am with you. God's doing the talking here. He says, do not look anxiously about you for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. This morning... I want to make sure that you know God's hand is on you. He hasn't forgotten. He hasn't left behind. He's not so focused on the present that he's forgotten about you. His hand is on you. Listen. Look. Follow, be attentive to his voice. The word is follow. The word is follow. But still, some don't follow because they get stuck. Stuck in the present. Stuck in the past. And the last thing that I want to talk about this morning, and some get stuck practicing the wrong things. When I was in high school, I loved to wrestle I wrestled with the high school team and then after practice sometimes I'd go wrestle with the college team at Southern Tech other times I'd, I'd go wrestle with the college team at Georgia Tech the field house was open over the weekends and sometimes college wrestlers from from all over the southeast people who lived would come and, and practice there at Georgia Tech and I'd wrestle college wrestlers from all all over the country during the summer it was the same thing during the summer, I would wrestle college tournaments, and it was a different kind of wrestling. It was called freestyle or Olympic-style wrestling. Well, my junior year, I won state in the Olympic-style freestyle wrestling, and they, they took all the state champions, first, second, and third place, in the state of Georgia, and they, they, they sent us to, um, to wrestle in the nationals in Iowa City, Iowa. Well, this was a big deal because they had given us a coach, coach who had been a, a, a great college wrestler and, and he began to 
to coach us in the weeks leading up there to the, to the national tournament. But it was a different kind of coaching than I'd ever had before. Um, and, you know, sometimes you learn, well, I won't speak for you, I'll speak for me. Sometimes I've learned more from bad examples than I've learned from good examples. And this coach was one bad example. All he told us was the things that we couldn't do. Oh, you don't want to try that move with the boys from Iowa because they'll eat your lunch. Oh, you don't want to try Whatever you do, don't try that with the kids from, from uh, uh, Oklahoma because they'll turn you inside out. And boys from Pennsylvania, they'll make a pretzel out of you. You don't try that. Oh, and whatever you do, don't do that with somebody from New York. He, all he did was coach us on what we couldn't do. Day in, day out, week in, week out, he told us what all, he instructed us all in what we couldn't do. Well, there were a bunch of pretty good wrestlers there. Everybody had won a state championship. So it's little wonder that when we got to the nationals, everyone was immediately destroyed. All except for one kid, the kid who never came to practice. He had talked to his high school coach who opened up their field house, and he and his friends would come and re wrestle regularly. <laughs> Sometimes we get so focused on what we can't do and practicing the wrong things, practicing the wrong things, that we lose out on what we're called to do, what we're made to do. The Pharisees right here, they were practicing the wrong things. As soon as Jesus called Matthew, Jesus began to eat with other tax collectors. He began to eat with the sinners. And that's when the Pharisees, the Pharisees right here in verse 11, they saw him and they said, why? Why? Because you see, they were practicing. And they were practicing hard, harder than anybody else. But they were practicing the wrong things. They were practicing making lists. And these are the lists that they practiced. They practiced making a list of the people that they loved. This was called the A-list. On the people that they loved, these are the people that believed like them. These are the people that behaved like them. And these are the people that belonged like them. But they practiced making lists, and not only did they have an A list, the Pharisees had a B list. And these are the folks that didn't behave like them. They didn't belong like them. They didn't believe like them. These were the people that, well, they were the tax collectors. They were the, the sinners. They were the, well, they were the others. And there were lots of those folks. And they practiced an A-list and a B-list, enemies and allies. They practiced us and them. Well, Jesus calls them as well. He calls them to learn and to listen. What this means, I desire compassion. And not sacrifice. That that list, the B list of those that they'd tried, those that they convicted, those that they'd sentenced ever to be enemies because they didn't belong, because they didn't behave, because they didn't believe the, the, the killer bees like they did. That called to compassion. For those people. During this pandemic, it's been a time where we've been isolated. It's been a time where maybe more than ever in, in our lifetimes, we've, we've had time to consider. To consider. And our natural tendency is, is to consider, to practice, to rehearse lists of us and them. To consider an A list and a B list. Consider 
those who've done us wrong to consider how we might have tried, convicted, and sentenced them. To consider how we might keep them in the prison that we've built for them. But that's practicing the wrong things. Jesus has more for you and me than that. He's called us to a life, not where we, we practice lists, where we practice convicting and sentencing others. But instead, he's called us to practice compassion, offering the same forgiveness to others that we use to forgive ourselves. Colossians 3.12 says, And so as those who have been chosen by God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you forgive. This morning, it may be that uh, this time of pandemic has brought out not a time to follow, but instead a time to make lists, a time to divide us and them, an A list and a B list. And you sense that That God this morning is calling you to follow. Follow not your A list and your B list, but to follow Him. Calling you to follow. Follow out of a, a present where you've gotten focused, focused on what's just before you. He's called you to follow out of a past where you've blown it, where you know your brokenness. And to follow you into a future, a future that's filled with hope, the hope of the risen Christ, that Jesus gave his life on the cross for you and me to wipe away our brokenness, to wipe away the the tenets we have to get stuck where we are, to wipe away our tendency to lock people in prisons of our own making and he rose again to give you and me power power to forgive to forgive ourselves of our past to give ourselves and move on in the present and the power to set free with compassion the same kind of forgiveness we give ourselves to set free with compassion other people Jesus knew that kind of compassion he offered it to Matthew the tax collector in his hometown now it may be that there's someone that has done you wrong someone that has hurt you and hurt you deeply this morning I want to pray with you Pray that his power enter enter your life. Join with me in prayer. Let's pray. Jesus, we need your power. Power that, well, you set the prisoner free. And that prisoner, well, it's us, but it's also neighbor. The one that we've tried to keep behind bars of us and them, of enemy and ally of those that are tried, convicted, and sentenced because maybe that they've hurt us in some way. Breathe on us the power of your spirit, a power to forgive, a power to be free, and a power to follow you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 
Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith, and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online. My hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church. And we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life. And my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us. <music>